Hello and welcome once again to Loveland's Talking. My name is Andy Hiller. I'm the City Public Information Officer here for the City of Loveland and I'm here with you this month as we are every month to share with you the public information about what's going on with your city government. Today we're going to be talking about an unusual intersection. I would call it personally a very unusual intersection um, that, that's coming here to Loveland or at least planned to, to be here. It's very intriguing. I invite you to stay tuned for this because it is unusual. It's called a continuous flow intersection. We will refer to it here often as a CFI, continuous flow intersection, and it's planned for the intersection of Madison and Eisenhower. And if you've ever been to that intersection, Section, especially heading south on Eisen, uh, Madison and wanting to make a left turn, you know that um, it can be a bit congested from time to time. So we're going to spend some time here learning why this intersection is needed, how it works, and the benefits to you once this thing is constructed. So let's begin by having my guests introduce themselves. Uh, Bill, why don't you go first? Okay. My name is Bill Hange. I'm the city traffic engineer and I'm basically responsible for uh, the installation, maintenance and operation of traffic control devices, sign signals and markings. Wow, you're the traffic light guy, huh? I'm the traffic light guy. Okay, all right. <laughs> Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Nostman. I'm a project manager with the Public Works Group in transportation. We take capital dollars and we try and translate that into improved situations for the public safety major issue and also getting cars to flow, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. Okay, good. And I'm Dave Clockman, the city engineer, and uh, work with Bill and Tom on street capital projects and traffic uh, lights and signs and striping and stuff, as well as uh, drainage and our street maintenance programs and the review and approval of new development projects, as well as the construction of all of the aforementioned. Okay. So you guys are involved primarily with, with the design and operation of our streets and getting traffic flowing on, on our, our streets as opposed to the actual construction people. You, you do design and the plans and oversee that rather than actually uh, running those cool bull, bulldozers and things. We don't run the equipment but we're going to get everything prepared so that that can come to town and unfortunately that's not the popular part but after we're done we're hoping that there's an improvement okay okay so guys thank you very much for introducing yourselves uh, let's get back to the concept of CFIs I'll tell you as, as Tom knows because we spent a bit of time together when I was first introduced to this uh, we found it very unusual, and um, t to just discuss it is kind of difficult to explain to people how this thing works. So um, we're going to, uh, in a moment here, take a break and have you folks look at a, a very enlightening five-minute video about this, starring, ta-da, our friend Tom in, in the middle, who will explain um, what this thing looks like and why it's needed and how it works in, in actually less than five minutes, but it also features some animation, uh, which uh, makes it a lot easier to understand how all this works. So um, with that in mind, guys, why don't we uh, take a moment here and watch the video. Little GTO, you really look at Three deuces and a four speed. The City of Loveland Transportation Engineers, the same people that brought you roundabouts, want you to consider a new, unusual traffic flow concept called a Continuous Flow Intersection, or CFI, which has been selected for Madison Avenue at US 34 Eisenhower Boulevard. A Continuous Flow Intersection is new and unusual, and this video will show you how it works. First, let me tell you why it's needed. Hi, I'm Tom Nostman, a public works engineer working to make traffic flow more efficiently at US 34 and Madison Avenue. US 34 Eisenhower Boulevard is the lifeblood of our community. It's the main traffic artery from east to west from Sentara to Rocky Mountain National Park and it's suffering from impaired circulation. The flow of traffic on US 34 and the streets bringing traffic to it has become congested and will only get worse with no action. 
Anytime a traffic light stops traffic on 34 to allow side street traffic to flow across or onto 34, the flows stop. Madison Avenue intersection, a major feeder to US 34, is a fine example. At busy times on Madison, motorists may have to wait two and sometimes three cycles to make a left turn. Lengthening the Madison left turn arrow helps those drivers, but at the expense of US 34 traffic. With a conventional left turn lane and arrow system, everyone else at the intersection sits and waits while a few cars make their left turns. Plus, there's a dead time when the left turners are stopping and the through traffic has not yet started. No cars anywhere are moving then. With the CFI arrangement, left turners and through traffic are moving simultaneously in both directions and the left turn dead time is eliminated. Let me show you how it works. The animation you're about to see was produced for a CFI intersection in Utah. But imagine this is the intersection of Madison and Eisenhower heading south. Making a left turn will be as easy as one, two, three. Let's take a quick look. Step one, cars turning left will start by lining up in the left turn lanes just like a normal intersection, only a little further back. Step two, when the left turn light turns green, you'll drive across the oncoming lanes to all new lanes on the other side of the road. Step three, another left turn signal will then tell you when you can go ahead and make your left turn. It's that easy. Now let's look at this as if you're making a left turn from Eisenhower onto northbound Madison. Making a left turn from Eisenhower onto Madison is the same as a normal intersection. The only difference is that you'll need to watch for another light just past the intersection on Madison. If you're the last car to making this left turn, you might see a red light here. This is the light that allows left turning cars to cross safely in front of you. Right turns are really easy as you can see here from the Madison perspective. Just make your turn, merge with traffic and keep right on going. CFI intersections are used today in Colorado Springs, Salt Lake City, New Orleans and elsewhere. More than 50 CFI intersections exist in Mexico. How much will it cost? About the same as a conventional intersection improvement. Also, the CFI has less impact on neighboring businesses, plus fewer environmental concerns. When will this be built? Construction is scheduled to begin in July 2010 and end in November of the same year. But there are many steps ahead before the shovels will hit the ground on this project, including multiple opportunities for the public to get involved. We'll keep you informed. Drive safely and friendly. Thank you for watching. I'm the coolest thing around. Little buddy gonna shut you down. When I turn it on, wind it up, blow it out, GTO. Tom, I think that's a, a very good video and good explanation of a, a complicated subject in a short period of time. I think it worked. Very well. The video begins by focusing on Highway 34 and explaining that it's suffering from uh, a bit of congestion. Can you explain that in a little bit more detail? Sure. You know, Andy, as the video talked about, 34 is our lifeblood, getting people to and from the community out into the highway and to their destinations, and we want to keep that flowing. Any activity that's necessary along the side streets, business access, and the major roadways is going to deter traffic flow and so that's a critical element to the flow of traffic. We have projected that the 2030 traffic flow the per day yeah, in the year 2030 will be 50,000 vehicles and that's a lot of movement on that highway and so we've got to accommodate that and also those roads coming down. Madison brings approximately 30,000 vehicles during the day wow. to 34 and so we're dealing with a 75 80,000 ADT intersection and we need that to flow well. 
Well, Bill, you may not remember this. A couple of years ago, we had a conversation, and I really learned a lot from, from that particular conversation. And the whole concept of, you know, when this was a smaller town and, and the main roads like 34 and Taft or Wilson were the main roads, and there, there were crossroads, um, there wasn't all that much traffic on crossroads. But today, every, there's more traffic on the crossroads, which means the main roads have to stop more frequently to accommodate the traffic on the crossroads. And the bottom line is everybody likes green, nobody likes red, and everybody thinks their lights can be easily timed. And I'll share this too, because uh, you know downtown where we have one-way streets, it's pretty easy to time all those, all those streets. But if it's a two-way street and it's green in one direction and the timing is right, then people going the other way, it's not timed correctly. So it, 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 it's, it's quite a challenge. Uh, um, I, explain how that works a little bit more, if you would. Okay, the you're right. The one-way streets are easy, relatively easy to do. Uh -huh. When you throw in the opposing direction, and a lot of times we don't have ideal spacing between the signals, so we basically look at time and space, and the one-way streets are easy to do. You throw in the complication of uh, another direction, a second direction. And then you put in the complications of more phases, the arrow times. Mm. Then you end up with a complex problem that um, sometimes you end up having to favor one direction or the other. You can't make it work perfectly for all directions. And, and traffic flow is always the same at any given time of day. It's the same at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning as it is at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, right? Right, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> the problem that we run into, the challenge of it is, is just that, the peak times we have. And, and especially on 34, we have kind of a continuing increase during the weekday uh, from the morning until 6 o'clock at night plus, depending on the day. But uh, that's, that's another complicating factor. So you have different directions. You have lots of phases that can be complex. And you have the interaction of one signal to another. If it was one-way streets, it's fairly simple. Not so with two directions and then cross-street traffic heavy cross street traffic like you just mentioned. Okay. Speaking of heavy tra cross street traffic, that gets us back to our friend President Madison. It's interesting that, that we have a presidential issue here in town with Madison and Eisenhower and all of that. So you explained that the traffic flow on Madison is, is pretty heavy. Here's a look at a uh, city map with that intersection circled. Uh, why is it so heavy there specifically? Let me take that one. Sure, when you look at um, Folks trying to come from the northwest or the west part of town to go east, there's a little, well actually it's big, uh, and blue on this map, it's Boyd Lake, and they have to basically come down to US 34, uh, Eisenhower Boulevard in order to go east. And so if they're coming over on um, 37th or 29th, they're coming perhaps on 29th as far as Madison and then coming down rather than coming all the way to 34 to start with because there's a lot of folks headed out east to, to do things. And sure. uh, that's the same is true when they're coming back into town. If they're heading back into the northwest part of town, they have to come through that intersection. And some go straight west and some turn. So you have all these people going in different directions at, at different times. And, but they're generally headed in, in, in a similar fashion to the same location. And, um, to Greeley or to Denver or parts right. beyond, but they have to get around those lakes. Yeah. Well, have you thought about uh, just filling those those guys in or building suspension bridges or, or, <laughs> or something else to, to solve this problem? You guys are pretty creative. Well, we have <laughs> thought about some bridges, uh, I mean, tunnel, not a tunnel, and a, is and a tunnel. Oh, it's a tunnel. <laughs> a tunnel. Yeah. You know, some roads little... cost four hundred dollars a lineal foot. Bridges tend to cost four hundred dollars a square foot. Uh -huh. So when you make them. Oh, you know, 50 feet wide, that's a lot Under different, $20,000 a lineal foot as opposed to $400. So um, it's, yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> okay. However, we, we do have this thing, you know, the green not only matches lights, but we also have to consider the green money side of this equation as well. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just teasing, you know, in, in addition to Boyd Lake on there, you've got, I think, Horseshoe above it as well and all those little lakes in there so uh, 
Um, it, there aren't too many choices for a motorist other than uh, Madison if, if they're coming in that area. All right, so let me just ask you guys this. Wouldn't the simplest thing be just if, if, if and, and what we're talking about for this intersection, if I'm correct, the, the, the major um, reason for all of this is because of the need for left turners on southbound. That, that's that's the, the, the issue that ties up 34 the most. So why can't you just make the left turn arrow longer? Wouldn't that be easier? <laughs> just stretch it out a little bit. Come on, Bill. It sounds sounds easy. That for us? Sounds really easy. <laughs> the problem is that we're robbing time from the other phases. And so we have the most traffic, like we said before, on 34. Oh, up to, we'll be up to 50,000 vehicles a day on 34. And then we've got pushing 30,000 on Madison. So for those smaller percentage left turns, we're going to be using more time and taking more time away from those movements, which is going to congest sure. the intersection okay. even worse. So it's a whole, it's a large balancing act like we talked about. So if, uh, if just making one left turn lane uh, the time longer, how about what, what uh, we've seen elsewhere around is double left turn, twin left. So what's the right name for that? Dual left turn. Dual, dual left, left turns. Hello. You bet. Mate, that makes and you know you can even left turn. Please. You can even go three left turns. So you're just basically bringing everybody to the intersection, stacking them up, getting them ready to go, so that when you have that little segment of green arrow time, then everybody's moving. The problem is space, Andy. That real estate at that major intersection is expensive. Fifteen dollars a square foot. And so each lane we add pushes the intersection wider, makes it more difficult for pedestrians to move across that great expanse. And so we get really challenged as we add those lanes in. So dual lanes is good, but like Bill pointed out, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So we give more time to the, to the dual lanes and we give, we're able to move those lefts, but at the expense of everyone else and, and i'll reiterate i've learned a lot working with you guys on this it, it's not just you got to remember it's not just the cross street traffic that that folks that are waiting when a left turn takes place it's the people the through lanes and, and we're going to look at look at that in some more detail and in some more numbers and uh, look at the numbers on that and also talk about some of the real estate issues you just the, the you just mentioned you, yes yeah. the other thing you get andy too is that you don't always get what you would think double the volume usually there's a percentage lower than doubling the left turn volume even though you got two lanes i got you so you don't always get what you think okay uh, on that so you pay for double but you don't necessarily get it all. get yeah. double okay right. so we're going to look at another map here because my question is and people you'll as i say stay tuned because this is when you see well we've, you've seen the video so you know this is uh, this is un, uh, un unusual um where did you get the idea for this thing and where else is it used well um we kind of found it in a mag magazine basically i was reading some articles contemplating what can we do at this intersection. Bill and I had really struggled with it because we were looking at standard conventional improvements for the intersection. And the traffic with that heavy southbound left turn movement coming out of the northwest part of town wants to dominate the intersection, but at the expense of everybody else. What can we do to make things flow? I hate to build a great big intersection and really not have it be any improvement. Just people are closer to the dance floor. They don't get to literally get out and on the dance floor. So we were looking for something. I found this in a magazine, started talking that up. We started looking at where it's being used in other places. And we found those in Baton Rouge, in the New Orleans area. Um, Salt Lake City has put one in, and Colorado Springs. And so we're seeing them come to U.S. market. Um, interesting history on it. It was developed 20 years ago. 20 years ago? Yeah. We're just hearing about it now. Yeah. Well, the issue was that the engineer put a patent on these, and so they didn't have a lot of use in the United States during that period. They did get used quite a bit in Mexico. I don't know if they were paying the uh, patented yeah, okay. <laughs> needs, but um, during that period, they just kind of languished. Now that the patent has expired, we're able to take advantage of this system, and it is 
does have definite benefits. And you mentioned one in Utah, and that was the one that, that the animation in the video came from. Correct. So um, we, we borrowed, uh, with, with their permission, um, Utah's uh, animation rather than try and recreate it. And also, uh, we're going to, at the end of this show, we're going to look at some of the uh, results from a survey in Utah after, uh, after it was in place. So let's move ahead. And this slide here says 86% at red light. Please explain what we're, we're looking at and what that number represents. Well, sure. Um, this is the way the intersection is configured today. So Madison is going across the screen left, right to left. Right is north, and so if you're coming south and you want to turn toward the highway, you're making, I'm sorry, I have that wrong. Uh, north is on the left, right. and if you're coming south on Madison, you would be the yellow cars turning to the top of the screen and going out to the highway. So yeah. there's, during the left turn phase, the green arrow phase, you only have two lanes moving, only um, 14% of the cars are moving and 80%, 6% are stopped. Okay, so to, to accommodate those few cars turning, everybody else is sitting there, okay? So option number two, and we talked about this a little bit, would be the double, excuse me, dual, dual, dual left <laughs> turn lanes, eh? Um, the number here, Bill, um, you want to talk right. about that? So tell us about that. I guess the, the point is you do get some increase in efficiency, but not a lot. Not a lot. Okay. There's still like 76, three quarters of the people are still sitting at a red signal um, wondering why they're sitting there. Okay. <laughs> and with the CFI, here's more what it looks like. And, and why is the number so significantly lower here? Well, this, Higher for, for the moving vehicles. This is really it. This is why it's called continuous flow because we're trying to keep everybody moving at once. The dance floor is being used. The dance floor is that area in the intersection that we're tying up with cars. And with the continuous flow, because we're putting three signals in series and using the efficiency of detaching the left turners and getting them up to and ready to move, we can have 44% of the traffic stopped. And that means that we got 60 Six percent. Checking my math there. Fifty-six. Uh, Fifty-six. 56. <laughs> Moving um, on the the green. So. So in so in this case, both the, and then the big difference here is that in addition to to in the other ones, it's only the left turners that are moving, and with the CFI, it's both the left turners and the through traffic moving simultaneously, and they're not. T-boning each other as as they do that. Yeah, they're, for the current cir circumstances, that's not what you want. Well, that, and that's one of the things that Salt Lake City found once they opened it is they actually had market safety improvements because the left turns were managed back and away from the conflict zone with a light, and so you don't have those really nasty injury-producing T-bone accidents. So, okay, back to today's intersection. You saw the slide a minute ago. Um, this is today's, um, do you guys have any idea currently what the uh, left turn, southbound left turn duration is on the timing of the light or how many cars get through? When, when everything's loaded it's uh, with the clearances, it's, it's only uh, 15 seconds of the total cycle time. Really? And wow. 11 of that is green. So there's some clearance intervals in there too, yellow and all red. I got gotcha. you. So it's a small, small percentage, but it is something that's significant. You look at trying to rob time from other cycles to make uh, sure. everyone so, happy. So if you made that 30 seconds, then everybody else would be waiting that much longer. That's right. Okay. Okay. Now let's again take another look at this. Um, here's our CFI. Mm -hmm. We talked about how the, the, both the left and the through lanes are moving simultaneously. Um, okay, here's the challenge, guys. We're going to zoom in, if you will, on one left turner because uh, the one thing that I've learned on this, it is kind of when you see the bird's eye view, it's a bit confusing, but maybe from the driver's seat, if you were sitting in the driver's seat, 
it wouldn't be all that unusual. So one of you take us through a left turn. I'm going to see if I can get my mouse to, uh, to work here. Oh, there it is. OK, so we're starting here. What do we have here in phase one or, or location one? Sure, Andy, I'd be happy to do that. Um, the yellow car is depicting how a left turn will be made. And again, this would be Madison approaching Eisenhower from the north. So you're southbound and you're going to go out toward the highway. In position one, this is the stack area for those left turns. So rather than being set at the intersection, where your cursor is, right. it's going to be set back about 350 feet from that point at a light that holds that traffic until it's ready to go. So when it turns green, that car and uh, the group of cars that are stacked there are going to move across the through lane. So can you show us the through lanes there, Andy, with your right cursor? Right. There they are. They're held by the light. And that yellow car is going to sweep across go into a special left turn bay and move forward to position three at the signal. Right there, they will get a green so that they're not stopping again. And they just move on to Eisenhower with their left turn. And then what, I've, what I learned is I learned about this and kind of digested it. It's kind of the same. Right now, if you want to make a left turn, you pull up to the, to the, to the stop place and you wait for the left turn arrow. And then when you get it, you turn left and proceed. This is basically the same thing. The biggest difference is, and if I can get my cursor to work, here it is, is that you're stopping back here instead of right at the intersection. But when the light turns green, off you go, and um, you head forward and make your left turn. And if you notice, too, where we have some land available, there is dual lefts on that movement. So we are taking advantage of uh, more efficiency that way as well. Okay, so the southbound will be dual lefts in addition. Right. And I'm going to give up on my cursor, but the other point is here, maybe not. Come on back here. I can't find There it is. Okay. So so when the, when the yellow car above my cursor here gets the green light, simultaneously the, the, whoops, the through cars that are here get the green light. So the through cars here, as well as the left turning car here, are all moving simultaneously, and that's what gives us that graphic of both through and left moving at the same time. How did I do? That's exactly right. And, and the, the real thing that we're trying to strive to achieve here, Andy, is being able to give as much time to that southbound left, that critical movement, without deterring the rest of traffic. And the CFI is able to do that. We can give almost 30 seconds over to the left turners and the through, where currently it's only 11 seconds that we're able to give to that green arrow time. Um, that's a real benefit, and that moves a lot of vehicles, but it doesn't come at the expense of Eisenhower. Eisenhower actually, with this configuration, can pick up maybe 10 to 15 seconds of additional green time going its direction. So. That's a win-win type of solution. As I understand it, normally you would have the left turners, and there'd be a time element, and then the through traffic and a time element, after which the cross traffic, in this case, Eisenhower, would begin. So Eisenhower would have to wait for both left and through, one after the other. But because they're moving at the same time, Less time is needed for the for for the Madison folks, so Eisenhower has to to wait less time. I, I think it's pretty cool, right. but it, it, it takes a bit to kind of grasp all of this. Okay, so, I guess Andy, yeah, not please. to cut you off, but yes, I no. do want to emphasize yes. that again in the bird's eye view of it, it does look complicated, but at the ground level, as you're driving it. Your expectations are standard. You're coming to an intersection, you get signs, it's telling you where to turn left, you have a signal that tells you to move across the lanes and delivers you to the left turn lanes and on through. So. Exactly, and the next video that we hope to put together in the near future, we have a, a staff member who, who went to Utah. Correct. And uh, he and, and his, his uh, companion took uh, a camcorder and basically drove the uh, the completed CFI intersection that you saw the uh, animation for in, in the video. And when you look at it from the driver's perspective, 
no big deal, piece of cake. Right? Pretty, pretty standard looking signals yeah. and pretty you know, good guidance with what we're proposing. Yeah. Okay, well you were talking about green before. Let's talk some more about green. This thing gonna cost more, less, whatever, than, than the other options. Well, uh, I'll be on the hot seat in that one. Okay. Um, okay. The CFI does cost more. It is a bigger area that we're talking about, but when we break down those costs and look at the right-of-way that it also takes, which is in a vacant lot and in green space, and balance those out, essentially the bottom line is it's a wash between the double left conventional and the CFI. Why is that? Because one wants to move in the northwest, the conventional moves to the right. northwest towards 7-Eleven and towards Flowerama, where the CFI wants to move in the other two quadrants which are available, which is towards the vacant lot and towards Sam's. That gives us an advantage. So the, the construction cost for the CFI is about a half million dollars more. But the right of way for the conventional is about a half million dollars more. So that's where the wash in the cost comes. So instead of having to buy and use land from the very busy Flowerama and 7-Eleven, you would, under this configuration, you're buying it from the opposite corners, from basically just the, the, the landscape um, grassy area corner where Sam's is, and the vacant lot, which might mean the end of that, that firework stand might have to move. I mean, have you considered that? Well, I mean, people might know? have to get their peaches someplace else. Peaches, yeah. too. Peaches yeah, so. and fireworks. Okay, <laughs> well, they might have, well, that's probably a, a lot less costly than uh, having to deal with uh, fuel tank removal and gas pump removal at, uh, at 7 Eleven. That is that a secondary sort of concern for us. There is uh, a product plume, meaning that there's gas that's leaked out of tanks in those old uh, filling stations, and Flowerama used to be an old filling station oh, yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, we are concerned about buying land that has environmental concerns sure. underneath that, and so the Schrader's station, the vacant lot that used to be a Phillips 66, has been removed and mitigated, and so we feel more comfortable that that is a good solution area. Okay, and I'm sure it makes those business people a lot happier because in addition to the land, I imagine there would be a, an impact on, on, on their cash registers in the bottom line a, as well. So. Right, if, if we do go the conventional route, we probably damage 7-Eleven by moving into their tank field and making it impossible to use the pumps that are there. With that, it gets really expensive. Yeah, maybe by being creative, maybe Flowerama could open a drive through window. Hey, they could have <laughs> both corners. Yeah, yeah. okay. They could hammer okay. out the window. Let, let, let's uh, let's uh, summarize a bit some of the benefits we've talked about. Uh, um, whoever wants to uh, kind of go through this list, although we've, we've talked about it. Well, I'll take the first uh, okay. bullet point there, move traffic, uh, more traffic's moving at the same time, and that was pretty well explained that we've got through movements moving with the lefts. On, on Madison, which we can't do now. And uh, our whole thing is about keeping the most vehicles moving, keeping them moving safely, and this is a good way to do that. Okay, okay. Well, I'll take the second one there. Less red on Ike, you know, Ike is our main street. That's where we started with the video. It's talking about its connectivity for the community. It's life, the lifeblood of our community. I think that if we add more red time to Ike, We've really failed the community, and so this solution allows us to manage Madison, do what we need to do there, but without taking away from Ike. Well, and to sort of piggyback onto that yes. is, you no know, Eisenhower is the, probably the toughest corridor that I have to time in town because of all the activity, and mm -hmm. we're we're a little short on number of through lanes on part of it. Right, We've got part of it up to six lanes, but. So it's probably the toughest corridor because of the spacing and the amount of activity. We got the biggest interchange in northern Colorado out there at 34 and I-25, mm -hmm. the busiest. And we have, you know, uh, triple lefts at one intersection further east. So it's the, it's the toughest thing 
the time in town and also with with some more green time then we get a we get a chance to free up uh, a few folks anyway and help us with our timing through the corridor so. okay Dave, you want to just reiterate real quickly the last two bullets? Yeah, here? I think th those two go really well together. It doesn't cost more, but the benefit is, is that it doesn't impact the existing businesses, which means, because if we buy businesses, then that generally means that we may lose some revenue on the sales tax collection side. I hadn't thought about that. Didn't so it actually is a, uh, it's a cost positive thing for the city. So it costs the same, but it doesn't, we don't lose, um, sales and use taxes and businesses and we are, are always watching out for existing businesses and properties and try to minimize an impact so this is really a win-win for us okay okay I hope it is for the traveling public for the city of loveland going back to the first two points well that, that leads into the next slide which is the folks of utah the traveling public in utah who have experienced one of these in salt lake city they followed up apparently with a survey and here's what they found Win, win, win. So yeah, when, when you get 83% believe that it improved traffic flow and over 80% that it was easy to drive and almost 80% that felt safe. And I'm not sure that you could say that about all intersect, big intersections where you have a lot of left turns where you get that kind of result. So that is definitely a win, win, win. And plus it's something new and unusual, et cetera. So that makes uh, adjusting to it a, a, a bit more challenging. And it sounds and looks more unusual than it actually is. From, from the bird's eye view. Right. The, com the commercial folks, too, you know, they, they, when they locate businesses or want to redevelop areas, you know, they're looking for a lot of numbers, a lot of volume. Yeah. But also there's the converse of that. If it's congested, people may tend to avoid it. So the idea is to have the best of both, you know, have a lot of volume, but also that it's seen as being more free-flowing and easy to get into access-wise. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, so that's kind of a, a general response from uh, that survey. A couple of folks uh, wrote in a note or two on, on the survey in the margin, and we'll just leave this on the screen for a minute and let uh, you viewers read this. Uh, I imagine, I didn't see any, but uh, I imagine there were probably one or two that weren't quite as uh, positive as, as these. But anyway, uh, this kind of gives you an idea of, uh, of some people and, and how they uh, responded to it and uh, kind of saw it from, from, from different Andy, perspectives. Andy, I, I guess yeah. I would like to throw in anecdotally, mm -hmm. as Salt Lake City was moving toward opening their CFI in yeah. September of 2007, mm -hmm. we knew that we were considering this, we wanted to see what their experience was, so we were monitoring the Salt Lake City newspapers. Ah. And in that period prior to opening it, there was a lot of negative press. There was a lot of concern about how to drive this. It was similar to the concerns that were brought up in this community about roundabouts uh -huh. as we move toward using those in our toolbox. Um, that negativity basically melted away once they opened it. There was no follow-up articles in the paper and all of the negative uh, comments in the comment section of the paper just dropped totally away. So we felt that and we talking to our peers in the UDOT Department of Transportation right. found that they just had a really good experience with it after it opened up. So we felt that was real positive. Good enough for them to, I think, pursue at least three more in the same corridor. Is that right? Uh, so that's, yes, that's a pretty good testimony that it's working. So. I got you. So within a year's time, they already felt like it was such a success that they were planning three more in order to take advantage of these. Sounds good. Okay. Well, time for a little advertisement. Okay. You folks, I, I know Tom will be there. I don't know specifically if you guys will be there also, but the public is invited. If you want to ask some questions or see, see these diagrams cl close up and, and, and uh, bring up a point or two with these fellows or some of the other folks involved with this, um, an open house is being planned, or actually a pair of open houses, so, um, at the police and courts building at uh, 810 East 10th Street. You know where the police building is on the east side of town. And the, I, I imagine you'll, you'll show the video and some of these graphics will be uh, available and you guys can uh, all answer questions. 
That's correct. We've had a number of open houses in the developmental phase when we were considering the conventional aroundabout and the CFI. Um, now that we've selected those, we're trying to get the public to understand what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, uh, the construction and the impacts. And so we want as many people as we can to come forward and so we can talk to them. These fine gentlemen hopefully will be joining me at that uh, open house and those will be at the police and courts like you said. Time, date and place are on the screen, one in the morning, one in the, uh, in the evening, whatever is most convenient. And, and uh, Dave, as, as I look at you, I, I, I can't help but think uh, the uh, engineering folks and, and the city has some major projects going on. I mean, just broke ground the other day for the, uh, for the what's almost $7 million worth of improvements at uh, I-25 and Crossroads. This obviously will be a, a significant project and, and, and unusual. And then I don't know exactly where we are, but the uh, I-25 and 34 improvements is, is headed our way, or are headed our way soon. Right. In fact, for I-25 and 34, uh, the bid op bids open just two days from today when we're taping this. Yeah. On the, uh, I guess the 27th of September, and we're planning on having a groundbreaking around October 15th for that project. Wow. Wow. Okay. So no time off for any of you guys for about a year now, right? <laughs> <laughs> or more. <laughs> or more. Okay. All right. So. Well, um, we've covered, I hate to say a lot of ground because that sounds like a pun, but what the heck. We've covered a lot of ground here uh, t today. Is there anything else you want to uh, mention before we uh, wrap it up? Yeah, I think I'd like to just say that we talked a lot about technical jargon yeah. and, and Andy learned about dual lefts versus double lefts and <laughs> he's saying CFI all the time. Yeah. And at our next meeting, we're going to vote and see if we're going to teach him our secret handshake. <laughs> but uh, for engineers, yeah, you were, well, we have to take a vote. All right, I'd, I'd be very honored. <laughs> but for this particular unusual approach at this intersection, this, this makes sense from a practical standpoint. And we were skeptics, and we are typically skeptical. And when we looked at it from the bird's eye view, we had lots of questions, and we did a lot of research, and uh, had one of our engineers go out and videotape driving through one, and we had some videotape from some other ones of folks actually driving through them and experiencing them. And, and it really does make sense. And it's not, it's, when you get to it and it's open, you're gonna say, wow, what was all the, the talk about? This just makes sense to drive through this. I'm going left, I'm in the left lane, here I go. I'm able to go through there a little bit more smoothly is what we're hoping for. As traffic continues to build in the future, we feel like it has a little extra capacity so it, it can accommodate that better than some of the traditional solutions. And we just feel like it's a, a really a, a positive uh, solution for this very challenging location. And we're looking forward to this. And I'd like to think that uh, the more people learn about it and better understand it and, and, and uh, kind of digest how this thing works, like me, they, they will go, hmm, this thing really makes some sense and, and, and will work very well. So I encourage people to, uh, to um, you know, keep your eye out for things, re re read about it, attend the open house, whatever. But the more you learn, I think, like myself, the, the more, you, more you will understand this and, and, and appreciate the, everything that's gone on to this. So, guys, thank you. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We'll see you at the open house. <laughs> okay, you will indeed. <laughs> yeah, okay. And folks, most importantly, thank you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for taking your time to uh, spend some time with us here with Loveland's Talking. Again, I encourage you to uh, visit the open house and uh, learn more about this. And um, in about, oh, when, when is this due for con construction and completion? Well, we're about a year away. So yeah. we're looking to start the construction in the June, July of 2010 period yeah. uh -huh. and have it completed by November. So basically, four to six months uh, There'll be four intensive months where we're working hard on the north and south. Our plan is to keep Eisenhower impact to a minimum, keep the businesses um, available and accessed, and uh, move as quickly as we can. Okay, so not this Thanksgiving, but the following Thanksgiving. 
Um, Look forward to a new driving experience. There you go. Cool. There you go. Okay. Okay. Well, once again, thank you guys. Thank you folks for tuning in, and we'll see you again next month here on Loveland's Talking. So long.